Hello and welcome to The View from 22. I'm James Heal and I'm joined today by Katie Balls, political editor of The Spectator, and John McTernan, former advisor to Tony Blair. Now, last night was the Rochdale by-election and George Galloway won by 5,500 votes. Katie, talk us through it. So I think in some ways it was predictable because the bookies' favourite ever since Labour had to suspend its own candidate following comments he made about Israel um, has been George Galloway. But certainly in recent days, there's been a move, I think, amongst some pollsters, um, amongst some Labour figures to say they actually thought the suspended Labour candidate who appeared on the ballot as the Labour candidate, could still potentially win the seat um, because the postal vote went out quite early and perhaps because Israel-Palestine wouldn't be the only issue. Um, there could be this this move there, um, partly through, I suppose, a lack of information. Um, in the end, that has not proved to be the case. And I think, therefore, what's striking is how comfortably George Galloway has won the seat. Mm. Um, so he has a majority of nearly 6,000. It was previously a Labour majority of around 10,000. And if you look at the breakdown in votes, uh, George Galloway got nearly 40% of the vote. So 12,335 votes. In second place, you had an independent candidate, David Tully, who had 6,638 votes. Then the Tories were in third place on just under 4,000 votes. And Labour actually in fourth place on just over 2,000. Now, it's a strange one in the sense, I think as soon as they had to suspend their candidate, there was no such thing as a good result for Labour in the seat. And it's not as though they had been running an effective campaign to try and boost it. Um, but I think you still look at that. And I, I think this is a seat that hurts Keir Starmer. This is a result that does. Because George Gallery was in a large part, the reason they dividend delayed in suspending their candidate. Mm. When the first comments came through, they then took a day or two to actually suspend him. And when you speak to figures, they said, well, we didn't want to have a situation where George Galloway won. And now George Galloway is going to be entering the House of Commons. Um, He's going to be a vocal MP, I think we can safely assume. And he's got lots to say on Israel Gaza and his comments on winning, which was, you know, effectively Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza and you've been put on notice. If you think about how fractured the Labour Party has been on this issue, on the idea that Keir Starmer has not gone far enough, has not been clear enough, loud enough in calling for a ceasefire, how carefully they had to calibrate a response last week that ended up being quite good for Keir Starmer, but awful for Lindsay Hoyle, who was the one who ripped up the rules to to help Labour effectively. That was the outcome, regardless of the intention. Um, I think this just has a risk of reopening everything. John, what does George Galloway's return to Parliament mean for the Labour Party? In a way, it means nothing for the Labour Party because George has been out of the Labour Party for such a long time and this is, look, it's historic for him. He's been in Parliament four different times, three different parties. Um, I think what it means for politics uh, is when four out of five people in the country want an immediate ceasefire uh, in Gaza, that will have a political expression if it can and in one sense, George is that expression. I think... um, the shame of last week was that the party political manoeuvring of the Tories and the SNP to put Labour in a spot over Gaza meant that the Parliament couldn't come together with one voice on this when the country's got one voice on that. So a fail, you know, political problem is normally resolved with a political solution. George is a political answer mm. to the question of who will speak up for peace. The sadder thing for me is that Labour last week not only tabled a motion calling for an immediate ceasefire, it was passed by Parliament. It's actually UK foreign policy to have an immediate ceasefire. Um, But Labour have failed to communicate that because they feel trapped, the party feels trapped by its own internal fractures about that and failing to, to spot if the public, four out of five of the public want an immediate ceasefire, Labour should be shouting from the rooftops, we got the Parliament to agree with the public. We may be a tiny party, 200, 200 members uh, of Parliament. We've driven the debate. We've heard the public and spoken for them. And I think the space that George will occupy when he comes into Parliament, he'll say, as, as often as he can, I am the voice of the public. I'm the voice of Rochdale. I will fight for Rochdale. But when four out of five people in Britain want an immediate ceasefire, I'll be here to speak for Great Britain and Gaza. 
And Katie, um, John talks there about the importance of finding a way to express the kind of anger that a lot of people feel about what's going on in Gaza right now. Um, we've obviously had one contest where Rochdale, 30% Muslim, a lot of high feelings in that area about the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Um, how likely is this going to be a feature in the national election we're expecting later this year? So, of course, the usual by-election caveats apply, which is hard to read um, from a by-election, you know, as a direct read of what will happen in a general election, just as in recent Tory losses. Um, if you look at some of the, you know, the, the really large Tory majorities that Labour have overturned, the Lib Dems have overturned, um, everyone thinks the Tories will, are on course to do very badly at the next election, but you would think they would get back some of those seats because by-elections tend to be lower turnout and protest votes. That said, I think it is getting harder to dismiss um, the the notion that the current unhappiness about uh, Israel-Palestine, particularly amongst parts of the left, will have no impact on the general election. Because we now have had a few indicators to suggest whether it, you know, it's the level of protest, whether it's what happened in the Commons last week, whether it's the Rochdale by-election, whether it's the fact that you've had figures like Jess Phillips quit the front bench roles. Mm. Um, again, her seat is a heavily Muslim seat um, to represent her constituents. So you speak to those MPs where their constituencies do have a, a, you know, a large Muslim community. And there is a reason those are the ones who've been felt either the most pressure to quit or have been thinking about doing so. Um, there is a limit to the number of seats where this would be valid. And I think what the Rochdale by-election shows us is you need effectively a George Galloway type figure. So is there a party to the left of Labour, whether it is uh, the Workers' Party, which George Galloway, uh, of course, is uh, leading, or is it, you know, uh, other versions of that type of party? There's always talk about whether Jeremy Corbyn could have, you know, his Peace and Justice Party. Could that get off the ground? I think you would need almost another outlet for voters to go to, I think, for at least senior figures in Labour to start taking the threat as, a, as one that really could dent their chances in several constituencies. But it's certainly, I think... Uh, making MPs anxious at the moment. You think about some members, you know, you think about the shadow cabinet. I mean, Thangham Debenow and her new seat, which Bristol seat, has the Greens, I think, in the latest polling, very close behind her. Four points. So, so if there's something less, is that the thing that tips it? So potentially the Greens would take it. So, so I think there, there is a risk, but also I think it does raise a question about foreign policy in the Labour government and the pressure that would be on Keir Starmer. I suppose, John, what uh, the role of George Galloway has been is really to kind of amp up the temperature on all of this. Uh, you know, you look at his rhetoric, for instance, he's always someone very keen to attack Labour. And I think Labour might perhaps wanted to take the heat out of some of this issue. But given what we know about George Galloway and what his likely tactics in Parliament are going to be, that's not going to go away anytime soon, is it? No, look, I think you have to fight fire with fire. Uh, George is a street fighter as a politician. Uh, he's a great orator. He's, the, he's probably the greatest populist, apart from Ken Lewis, and the, the left of the Labour Party has produced. And I expect him to bring bring some drama back into the Parliament. Um, you know, I always ask politicians, if somebody's speaking, who would you go in to listen to? And it used to be Tony Benn, uh, used to be um, William Haig, people would go in, David Blunkett. I think people will go into the Commons to listen to George speak. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a draw factor there. And I like I, I want to build on what um, Katie was saying. Politics has to be expressed in the Parliament. It's either through our traditional parties or it's from parties outside. I think you know, when you, when Katie was talking, you know, if if Corbyn and uh, Galloway can form an alliance. Imagine if Corbyn stood as the Workers' Party candidate in Islington North, where you create a coalition of people loyal to, to Corbyn as a constituency MP, plus younger voters, plus plus people who've got who, who've got foreign policy as the thing that drives their their politics. I think you can see there's not a hundred George Galloways around the country. There are probably two or three seats where the right candidate with the right charisma uh, and the right positioning. I would have this. And I think it's a really important point that, that Katie has touched on. I was listening to the, the, the news this morning, and the top stories are about geopolitics. And if you think about it, whether it's China, Taiwan, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the American general election, Biden, Trump, uh, Israel, Gaza, almost everything that dominates our headlines is foreign policy. And yet, do we know what Labour or the Tories 
offering positive terms for foreign policy. The Tories did a smart thing, appointed David Cameron, who effectively operates as though he's got his own foreign policy. It's a Cameroon policy. So Rishi's privatized foreign policy. Labour, we need to hear what Labour thinks Britain in the world should be and would be under Labour. Because there's no doubt in my mind that people are voting in some senses on this. And my final point, I think, Labour should be addressing the Gaza issue, not directly because we've lost, we've lost so much ground there um, through the handling of the issue, the mishand- in my view, the mishandling of the issue. The Tories have now mishandled Islamophobia. I think Labour should seek to secure its, its voters by, I know, I'd personally invite Baroness Warsley to do a report on how to introduce a public duty to combat Islamophobia. I'd actually go deep into Tory territory, bring a Tory across, um, not to become a member, but to actually, let's, make, let's have a fight about Britain and Islamophobia and which matters more to Muslim voters. Is it Israel Gaza, which does a lot, or is it Islamophobia, which affects your life, which affects the discourse of politics? And in that way, we, you have to address, in my view, you have to address the issues which are real. The election of George Galloway and the second candidate being an independent tells me Rochdale feels abandoned. And George campaigned on Bradford Market, the covered market, and getting a Primark into the, and on saying, I do not trust what is taught in our schools. Mm. So this, you know, it's a kind of it's a, it's a leftist anti woke agenda. Yeah. There's a lot of space there. With a bit of social conservatism as yes, well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Katie, um, John there mentions the second place candidate David Tully did very very well. Let's talk about some of the other candidates as well. Uh, Labour's Azir Ali came fifth, and Reform finished sixth. Talk us through the results. Yeah, so the Conservatives came third, which isn't a good result for the Conservatives. I think it's getting less attention, just in the sense, I think it's quite priced in at the moment, the Conservatives are not in a good place, and by-election results are bad for them. I mean, the Labour result, I think, is the worst ever result for Labour post-war in a by-election, um, <laughs> to put into perspective. Um, now, of course, Labour said, well, we didn't run a candidate, we didn't campaign. You chose but a candidate. Exactly, yep. and this is the thing, right? It's for all the people who are saying, oh, why are you calling it a disaster? They weren't trying. It's like, well, they were trying initially and through self-inflicted mistakes in terms of the selection of their candidate. And moving the writ early. Uh, moving the writ early, yeah. picking their candidate, um, not doing the due diligence. Um, they found themselves in a situation where you had Labour on the ballot, but not a functioning campaign. Mm-hmm. And I think that's entirely on Labour and therefore it is a disastrous by-election for Labour. Um, the Tories also did very badly by historic terms in terms of um, you know, a seat where Labour were there, a big fall. Um, but so, so I think that just confirms again, it's not as though the Tories are benefiting directly, at least, from Labour problems. But I think in a state we weren't really expecting that so much, given the, the given the dynamics and Tories' position on a ceasefire compared to Labour's. Um, then you get to the reform vote, and I think that is quite interesting because there's a poll today, you got poll suggesting reform are now in 14% in national interest polling, yet they just managed to keep their deposit in Rochdale. And that was Simon Danksick, former Labour MP, another former MP like George Galloway, but this time with less success, um, and ran his campaign, managed, you know, a, a really quite a small number of the vote, came six in the end. And I think you would think in the seat, like Rochdale, we're talking about the Muslim community, but also traditional white working class. I think it's the kind of seat which you're expecting reform to do a bit better. Now, Richard Tice has suggested that, uh, you know, there are dirty tricks in the campaign, usual caveats uh, uh, thrown into that in terms of the various denials on that. But, you know, they will say, we didn't have the space, if you think about Simon Danks being turned away from the hustings, to, to have their message heard, so there are specific factors here. But I think after quite a few by-elections where the reform vote hasn't been bad, say, for example, in Wellin Borough, but it hasn't matched where UKIP was, and therefore I think reform are yet to show they can deliver in action and by-elections what the polls are currently suggesting. Mm. Uh, John, do you think uh, reform can learn something perhaps from George Galloway's success in having a charismatic orator, a bit of social conservatism and really focus on the issues in the constituency? Yeah, look, I think um, exactly that. I think George Galloway, if he'd been the reform candidate, would not have been turned away from a hustings. There is no way he would not have made his way in there. And I think that's the thing, that you either have confidence and gusto and swagger and you know it's about you, and there's only one politician in reform who knows that and acts like that, and it's Nigel Farage. And the thing, the thing about 
there's a real there's an overlap between Farage and Galloway. I think they they cl- they clearly get on. Um, it's, it's not a wrong thing in politics to like people with different different political perspective. They've got a similar attitude that they are going to be the change. They're going to make a change. They represent something that's deep and profound. I mean, George George Galloway in his in his in his, his election material said, "I believe in I believe in Britain." That's why I was for Brexit and against Scottish independence. And that ability to sum yourself up. And I think the lesson that I would learn if I was reform is you need Nigel back. You need Nigel to be clear. This is about changing the right of politics. George was like, I'm going to change the dynamic on the left of British politics. And he's changing the conversation. Farage has to do that. He's got to seize his opportunity. Maybe it's not about, maybe it's the exact right seat in the general election. And, and be, be clear, this may be the last act, you know, the final, the final, final retirement tour, but you know, um, go for it. And I think that's the, the, the lesson of by-elections is you can't, you can't elaborate a by-election into it with the general election, but they do show if you go for it, the public will respond. And the public are looking. The public are looking for change. There's no doubt about that. In Rochdale, they voted for two change options that were not either the mainstream parties. So there's a huge space out there for people to occupy if they can become the lightning rod. Thanks, John. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for watching.